Today, uh, this presentation will not turn you into quantum developers or quantum computer scientists. Uh, the point is, like the title says, basically to introduce different avenues in, in starting to learn about quantum computing. Uh, and first of all, I would of course like to thank everybody for being here, especially Fraktia for having me here. Uh, it's a topic that I've now talked about a few times, uh, so definitely always an interesting opportunity to talk about quantum computing. My name is Topi Asuotila, and I work here at Fraktio's basement, also called Nordcloud, uh, which is on the fourth and fifth floor of the same building. Uh, and while we're not really uh, doing a lot of business with quantum computing, we definitely have people interested in, in the topic. Uh, the agenda for the presentation is basically to first uh, go through how I began to study about this, this topic. Uh, then, sort of, for the uh, talk to make any sense, we will look at the definition of what quantum computing actually is. That definition has three really interesting parts that are related then to the three diff uh, next topics on the agenda. So, what are actually these really hard computational problems? What is meant by quantum mechanical effects? And then, sort of, what are those actually practical use cases for a quantum computer? And then finally, we get to the like to the uh, core of the presentation with those avenues of, of possible study to get get to know the topic. In well, it's quite impossible to know the topic throughout because it has a lot of things that are unknown to man. Uh, but sort of to get more confidence rather than just a glimpse, as we're having today. Uh, we've been running this this workshop all, also inter internally uh, at Nordcloud. So I would say that with a good background, it takes a minimum of three hours to get into the topic, sort of understanding what happens. Uh, but, but this is probably something uh, less than 45 minutes, so we will not be able to do that. Okay, uh, so I've known quantum computing more or less forever. Uh, in a sense, like people know black holes or, or everybody knows how an engine works, but sort of doesn't really know how it works. And, and as long as, at least as long as I remember, which is possible because the idea of a quantum computer was first proposed in 1982. Uh, but it was only in 2017 when I joined, joined our company when I started to look at like different technologies that are really uh, like cutting edge technologies, thinking what of those we should learn, would there be business for us, would there be something like, for example, quantum computing that might just have a marketing angle or, or something that we would, you know, inspire the people within the company to think about. Um, and then the, the key event that brought quantum computing into the agenda was, was Microsoft's re release of, of Q-Sharp, which is a programming language aimed at programming quantum computers. And I took a couple of our senior guys and we sat down and looked at the, the material that they had released and it was all just C-sharp, it was like no different. If it's all logical, you run it in a Visual Studio and everything. You have all the for loops and if and thens and so on. Uh, except then you had these mysterious parts, uh, like let's take a, a CNOT gate for these two qubits and then we have entanglement because we also apply a Hadamard and it makes, makes absolutely no sense if you've not studied the, the quantum computation. And Q-sharp, or the materials we did back then didn't explain that all that at all. It was like aimed at people who already know about quantum computing, but were just looking for tools to do the implementations with. So we really couldn't get a lot of out of that. But I, I wanted to you know, dive into the topic more and sort of understand because I didn't think it would be that super hard uh, to get to know the basics, at least understand what that sentence on the slide means. Uh, but it turned out quite difficult. Uh, back then I, I had a lot of difficulties finding any materials that would really dig into the what I thought was the most exciting part. You found uh, material on how the hardware is built, which kind of technologies are competing to be the standard architecture on the hardware level. Um, you found uh, very uh, advanced uh, material on quantum error correction and you'd find uh, uh, these different programming environments and programming languages represented, but nobody uh, was presenting the core, the sort of what is the quantum algorithm about in, in a sensible manner. And my sort of initial thinking was that that's the exciting part, that's the part that I want to learn about, and that's where the magic happens. And sort of naively I thought that, that with like classical development, the part that was always the interesting part was the algorithm. Uh, so this would be something that would be great, but 
but it's not quite that easy. So, but anyway, going through this path you know, on a uh, time span of a few months, I thought that, well, at least I could eventually write a blog post, like where did I find the information? Uh, and maybe that would be helpful for someone else. Uh, but that blog post never happened. Uh, instead, you now have this talk. So uh, the definition. Basically, when we talk about quantum computing, we talk about building devices and applications for those devices that utilize quantum mechanical effects to do such computation that would not be possible on an ordinary computer. Uh, sort of understandable, but like mentioned, it has those three parts that need further explanation. Uh, it's good to note that there are several uh, applications of quantum mechanics in different areas of technology that do not fit into this definition, but are still actually quite important that might also yield benefits way faster uh, than what actually quantum computing will. Uh, namely quantum cryptography, quantum internet, and, and quantum radar, uh, which is a technology the Chinese claim to already possess and, and able to detect uh, modern stealth fighters with that. But the three parts are, are as follows. So there's the quantum mechanical effects. Without knowing what those effects are, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, then there's a pretty outrageous claim that it would outperform even foreseeable, which is of course like, like you know, outrageous claim to say that even something we don't know yet, this would be better. Uh, but it's, it's sort of like made less ambitious with this cave at or limitation that it's only for certain tasks. And these three parts I would like to go through in the presentation. First, starting with this uh, outperformance. And to understand this, we would need to look at uh, what is meant by computational complexity. And uh, I've plotted here uh, three functions or lines. There's the blue line, which is a linear line. Then there's a, a uh, squared line uh, or a squared function as the red line, and then an exponential function as the yellow line. And uh, all of these, these functions like, like the blue and red line are, are usually grouped into polynomial functions, and then you have exponential functions like the yellow line. And, and the idea here is that, that you can model different kinds of computations as, as uh, or their difficulty in terms of if the x-axis x, x axis or the n uh, is the uh, size of the input, how big of a problem you're solving, then the difficulty of solving that or the time it takes is the y-axis. And these, these yellow problems with the increased input, they sort of explode. They become increasingly harder and harder. Even with just n being 10, we of course got the 10 with the linear model, we get 100 with the squared model, and then we get to 1024 uh, with the exponential model, which is of course double when for, uh, compared to what we would get with 9. So even if, we, if something improves linearly, uh, we get more power to uh, solve things in a linear or a polynomial fashion just by increasing the, the difficulty of the task with one unit, it sort of always ex escapes that. And, and it's based on this difference that they are able to claim that the quantum computer would be uh, more powerful than foreseeable computers. Because there's a certain trick which we will go more into more detail that would bring uh, some of these yellow problems into the category of these uh, blue and red problems if we were to utilize a quantum computer. Now, neat math, uh, but what kind of problems are these yellow problems? And there's three examples. Uh, there's a problem called the traveling salesman problem. Essentially, like illustrated on the map, you give a list, give a list of cities and ask which is the shortest or the quickest route through all of these cities. And whenever you add a new city, it, it becomes exponentially more harder to solve the, the shortest path. Uh, then there are different molecular simulations. Uh, you might have a, like a bigger protein or just a molecule. You add a, a amino acid or a, a new atom into the mix. And then you ask which kind of configurations I can build out of this. And again, when you add a, a next element, it could, uh, the possibilities become exponentially larger. Uh, and then in cryptography, uh, I would say that all uh, like publicly key cup cryptographies, which are the basis of the security on the internet, are based on certain math problems being exponentially hard. For example, here we're asking about which numbers have been multiplied uh, to come to 864. Uh, and this is 
hard to do when you increase the number from 864 it becomes exponentially harder to solve those uh, elements now uh, yep examples of hard problems but these are also super important problems so the traveling salesman is not just about a sales guy trying to visit Lahti and Turku and Tampere on the same trip it's basically equivalent to a large set of, of logistical optimization or a production optimization problems so if you have an airline uh, with a fleet of airplanes different cities where you can go to uh, prices that you get from each of those roads cost of uh, petrol and, and all of that that sort of an optimization problem is mathematically equivalent to the traveling salesman problem or you have a factory with different kind of units and production uh, production lines uh, optimizing which products you should use uh, when you should do maintenance, etc., is a similar problem uh, on a mathematical uh, sense or in a mathematical sense. Uh, the best example of this, this chemistry part is that uh, we're currently using about 3% of all world's energy consumption in a process called nitrogen fixation, uh, which is needed to produce fertilizer. Uh, nature does this with the fraction of that energy. Uh, Probably it's like a hundred percent reduction because the change is that diff that big might be 99.99 or something uh, And if we were to understand better if we were to able to model this nitrogenase uh, Molecule that does this part in, in nature We might be able to then save the three percent of the global energy consumption and of course there's like tons of new materials like could we improve Kevlar, uh, could we innovate new drugs uh, which are now more or less trial and error based research they might be done simulating and, and, and designing those molecules on a computer a quantum one then and then of course the not all the importance is from being a positive impact uh, if we break the cryptography there's not m many people that would view this as a as a good thing maybe there are a few at NSA uh, but that would more or less break the internet okay so now we know what sort of problems would be those super hard problems where we have this advantage that the classical computer will never reach according to the understanding that we have of physics the next part is like what is then the quantum mechanical effect and this is probably the heaviest part of the, the, uh, uh, this talk. Quantum mechanics, in my opinion, is best explained with this uh, double slit experiment. And this might be familiar um, from high school physics, where it's usually not with electrons, but with photons. And it's used to prove that uh, light behaves as a wave, that life, light has a wave, uh, the characteristics of a wave. Uh, when a monochromatic light so it has uh, just one wavelength not like natural light that has all kinds of wavelengths is uh, shown onto a uh, apparatus with two closely uh, close by slits uh, the waves pass the slits both of those slits and then the waves interfere so you have a hill on the other wave going through the left side and then you have a, a valley on the other wave going through the right side at some point here on the screen and then you get the dark spot there because those two waves of lights can just cancel each other out and then you have like these bright spots where those uh, add up so both are hills or both are valleys the same thing happens with with any particle so it's not just the particle wave duality for for a light but they also with electrons or, or atoms we have the same effect now this is sort of all logical uh, nothing weird about that uh, but actually the same thing happens even if we fire those particles one at a time so we make sure that it's only one atom going through there and we do not let the next atom start before we get something on the screen and we still get the interference pattern so then we have to deduce that the uh, somehow the atom or the electron went through both of those slits at the same time uh, to be able to interfere with itself now again this if, if it just is both a particle and a wave it's it's fine or then we may might conclude that particles are just an illusion that everything is, is a wave but if we do so that that we attach a measurement device in the leftmost slit and and try to see when the particle goes through the left side uh, 
it will say about 50% of the time that, yeah, now we went through the left side. But the, what also happens is that the interference pattern disappears. So measuring through which slit the atom or the electron went through uh, makes, it, makes this interference and the wave-like nature of, of that disappear. So the explanation we have for this in quantum mechanics is that actually, yes, the particle is at two places at the same time uh, in both of those slits. And if we measure the sort of probability distribution of, of on which slit it is, we make it collapse, sort of, it, it then reveals through which it goes, and it no longer goes through uh, both of those at the same time. And this is the, like, the fundamental weirdness of, of quantum mechanics. Now there's somewhat of a thought leap from here to building a computer, but, but that's what we're going to do next. So a normal computer would naturally be consisting of bits. They are either zero or one. And then by saying that the leftmost slit is, is zero and the rightmost slit is one, we have built a, a qubit, which if we measure, we know if it was a zero or a one. But if we don't measure, it was both. It was in a superposition of, of those two states. It went through both uh, as sort of analogy. And then our, our double slit is a, is a qubit for us. Um, and like mentioned, if we do the measurement, then it collapses to being either 0 or 1. And then there's a certain probability. If it's perfectly aligned, then it's 50-50. But then you can alter it so it's not 50-50, but something else. And these qubits, it's sort of tempting to first think that these are like between 1 and 0. Uh, but that, like we learned from the double slit experiment, it's, it's not in between because there's there's material in between there, it's, it's blocked, it's, it's both. The better analogy is, is that it's in both states at the same time. However, uh, most introduction videos on, on internet will, will stop at this and say that it's just both, but it's actually more complex. It's, uh, it's just a simplification to say that it's both. Uh, rather, if we think about a classical computer having a, a one single state of, of zero and one single state of one, then uh, the qubit has a sphere of possibilities and all the points on that, on that sphere are, are possibilities for that qubit to be in. And if, if we think about this halfway between zero and one, it might be the left or the right or towards you or towards the presentation in, in this point. That isn't super important, but if, we, if it wouldn't be like this, uh, then it would just be basically an analog computer and there would not be any, any uh, there wouldn't be actually an interference pattern because this, comp uh, this is uh, related to the phase of the light. Uh, and then without this, it wouldn't actually be better than a classical computer. Next concept that I would like to talk about is, is entanglement. And like somebody asked, would this presentation be in English or in uh, Finnish? Entanglement is one of those things I don't know the Finnish word for. Uh, and it's sort of a pair uh, for superposition. So without superposition, there would not be entanglement. Uh, and this means that we can generate such a pair of qubits, again, if we think about those slits, uh, that if we turn on the measurement and ask that if this qubit A went through the left side, uh, it will be a probability. We will get like a 50-50 answer, yes or no. But if we get the yes answer, then we will know for certain that another qubit also went through the left side, or vice versa. But we can get them sort of linked to each other. And how this happens, partly unknown to man, uh, but it's a phenomenon that, phenomenon that can be uh, proved experiment experimentally in nature. Uh, and there's like two important things to know. Because intuitively, or with like day-to-day -day common sense, you would think that those qubits somehow communicate with each other. They don't. They, the states are correlated, but they don't communicate. Otherwise, this would, this would uh, imply faster than light communication, uh, which is forbidden by, by Einstein's work. Uh, and also, they do not s uh, decide beforehand that, yeah, let's both go through the left side. Let's both go, go through the right side. It really is still a probability distribution until we measure, and then they are just correlated. Cool. Now we can do some, like, cut some corners and, and take some untrue analogies. 
because we've gone through superposition, interference and entanglement. And superposition basically, you can think of it like, wow, these qubits are inherently parallel. Like they're in the both states at the same time. If I have a bunch of qubits, I have all the states at the same time. Then the interference means that they actually do kind of calculation. They can also subtract, it's not just adding pieces or, or here or there, but you can also cancel things out and you can do more inter in intelligent calculation. And then the entanglement basically means that if you have a state of qubits that is entangled, you can make them interact with each, with each other uh, without any further computational steps. So they can interact in the computation without additional cost. And this sort of brings us to the fact that, okay, if I have a two to the nth size problem, the yellow line, I can make it a n linear blue line problem because the quantum computer computes all the values in parallel. Not perfectly true, but that's sort of the big idea behind the how we apply those quantum mechanical effects to achieve something which is impossible on a classical computer and super hard. And here, for example, if we would, let's say we need to crack a two-bit password. Uh, on a classical computer, we would go through all of the four possibilities. It's four runs. And if we add a, a bit, it of course becomes exponentially more hard. But then we would now, coming back to the Hadamard gate that was mentioned on the first slide, if we just put the first state 0, 0 in the quantum computer, run it through a Hadamard gate, which actually makes it a maximally, maximal superposition of all those states, we can just do a one run and it will go through all of those possibilities. Again, a untrue analogy, but sort of that's, that's where the magic comes from in a uh, hardly common sense way but common sense is not a good tool uh, with quantum mechanics or quantum computation. Uh, there's a saying that the physics dudes use, which is like, uh, shut up and calculate. Okay, so as said, not completely true, and they all already had this limitation. So for certain tasks, which tasks would this be possible? So it doesn't make every, everything parallel. You really need to find a specific algorithm for a specific task. And like I mentioned in the beginning, I was like excited because algorithms, yeah, fun, but it's like every new quantum algorithm is a scientific achievement. You make a paper, everybody celebrates because it's super hard to come up with new algorithms. So it's not like, yeah, I got this new algorithm for uh, optimizing my, my uh, ad displays on my web page. It's, it's not a new algorithm for calculating damage points in your FPS. It's like improving quick start, like super hard. And the algorithms that are, are most common are so that there's a very compact input, like, uh, like the list of cities. Well, that's already quite uh, not combat, but, but that's sort of what are the factors of this number? You just give one number to the algorithm. So it's a very compact input. And then it has a, also like a singular or very compact, compact output. So it's not a good tool to enum enumerate all the possibilities, like show me or all different paths that I could go through these cities. That's not a very useful algorithm for a quantum computer, but just like find me the best one is, is a better, uh, better algorithm or more likely a algorithm that would get an advantage from a com quantum computer. And even this, this famous factorization uh, algorithm is mostly run on a classical computer. It has like seven steps out of which only one utilizes a quantum computer. And that one part asks which is, the, which is a period of this periodic function. For example, if the function would be uh, f of x is two times x plus three modulo three, you could use that by just having a black box function. You could use this part to find out that the modulo is three. That's all. Uh, and since this, this measurement that we mentioned previously um, is probabilistic by nature, then these algorithms tend to be probabilistic as well. Uh, like there's another famous algorithm, which is about finding an element uh, from a list or an array, uh, but it isn't 100% certain to find, let's say the biggest element on that, on that list. It's just, you know, 99, 98% certain, depends on the, on the size of the array. 
So is the computer then useless? Well, you'll never replace a classical computer. It's not like somebody invents quantum computers and everybody buys a new iPhone. It's, it doesn't work like that. Uh, even though the quantum computer can do all the calculations that a normal computer can do, I just can't wrap my head around an idea that I would just like have a keyboard or, or a touch interface to a quantum computer. It's like, like it's, they are not in the same category of ideas. Uh, and the limitation of, of not having a quantum computer do everything is, is more like engineering what makes sense than computer science. So like any math problem that you can describe to a classical computer, you can also describe to a quantum computer because only thing you need to do is decide that, okay, I do not allow any mo other values for the qubits than zero and one, and then they're basically identical from a math perspective. Uh, so one sort of analogy that has been flying around is, is that maybe we would get like a quantum, or you can think about it more like a quantum processing unit in a similar manner that you have a graphical processing unit. Of course, with the difference that rather than getting smooth textures, uh, you would be able to lower the world's energy consumption by 3% and break the internet. Cool. Now, you might know what we're talking about. Because uh, we went through the definition and all the really important parts. Uh, so to learn, actually start learning about this, uh, there's like six paths that I can think about. First, might make sense to get into an actual cool school. Like, you know, they, they, a friend of mine is, is a professor at the Jyväskylä University on, on this topic. Alda has a, a good research group on, on quantum computing, but that's sort of lots of work. Like it's not very easy. Uh, you might read a book. I've tried reading a couple, but somehow for me it was too hard to have like a self-paced, unguided study model. Uh, or you could, you know, watch more videos like what this will probably become. But then these tend to be a bit confusing. Like just one video doesn't get really deep into that. But I think there's like three really good uh, ways for somebody who doesn't still look to divide, devote their whole life to this topic. Uh, there's a couple of nice games that try to explain the concepts. Uh, we have the workshop that I mentioned previously. Uh, it's kind of cheap, kind of cool. Uh, and then you can study online, which is the part that I took. And I'll go through a bit more detail in those latter three. So the games, there are at least three games. There's a one web-based game, uh, which is the first one on the list. And I'll try to put these slides ASAP uh, available as slides as well, so all the links then work. Uh, which is a puzzle game, more about how quantum mechanics works. Then you have two games, uh, more or less out of IBM. One being a board game, which is a print and play uh, free board game. It explains how these different gates work and how the qubits work and the same stuff also for a, a, uh, a mobile app game called Hello Quantum. And for me, these were somewhat confusing because they are, they used a bit different logic than what I had studied previously. But uh, for somebody starting out here, they might be really, really good uh, ways to get into the, the topic. Then we have a host of programming environments. Like when, when my journey started, I think Maybe IBM's Giskit, but at least, like I mentioned, Q Sharp was out. Uh, the others have sprung up uh, after that. Uh, and the ones we've used has been the IBM's Giskit, because that's basically the only one at the moment that is purely online available, so you don't need to install anything. And it actually allows you to run stuff on a real quantum computer. So it's not just a simulation, which is not very important in terms of learning the stuff, but sort of like really good motivational factor uh, to use. Uh, and the one change here is that, that this Rigetis, which is a startup, uh, their online availability is, is getting better. They just went to an open beta, so I'm expecting to get my account in a, in a few days. Uh, or I don't know, but you know, sounds promising. So that might turn it into a yes and yes uh, on this, this topic. Then, as mentioned, we're running those workshops. I'm running a four-hour workshop at the end of March, and we're probably looking to uh, 
give a workshop on this even prior to that in Yuvaskula. In well, that's something that you, where you can also uh, enroll already. Uh, and there what we're basically doing, we start from uh, not knowing even this stuff that we went through today uh, and then use that four hours uh, or three and a half hours uh, to get to a run a program on the IBM environment on a real quantum computer in a way that you actually understand why we did what we did and what those things mean. And then finally, the online resources. So there's uh, three different courses or topics that I, I've gone through myself. Started with the Berkeley's uh, YouTube lectures, very well taught, uh, a course, uh, starts from the basics and quite followable. But unfortunately, because it's on YouTube, you don't really have graded exams and everything, so it's more self-guided. Then the MIT stuff, which is their grad school material, uh, was super hard, at least for me, like the most difficult topics that I've ever studied. Uh, definitely way harder than becoming a Master of Science in Engineering in, in Helsinki. Uh, and then that, that, that's a, a university based in, in Netherlands, uh, the two twelfth, and their course is a bit more about the architecture of quantum computers and also the hardware technology, how that is built. But it was also super interesting to, to find out. And something that has happened uh, just lately that's that Microsoft has, uh, for example, uh, boosted their Q Sharp offering uh, by introducing a thing called Quantum Katas, which is more or less tutorials on GitHub on how to work with Q Sharp that to start then explain also these concepts and what you are doing. And then you have tutorials from individuals, uh, like there's one link to a GitHub that explains the traveling salesman problem and how that can be solved. All in all, the topic is super large, like this image is from the, uh, from the Q12 uh, course and any one of those parts in the architecture can of course be studied for I don't know how long. I, I assume at some point compilers will be as uh, a, a difficult topic as compilers are in a classical computer and you certainly can devote your life to, to classical computer program compilers. And additional things beyond this, this, uh, this architecture is the architecture in general, but then of course like learning more about quantum mechanics, understanding more about this computational complexity, and then there are other modes of computing besides this, like this, uh, what you could call like a generic quantum computer. The company called D-Wave that was mentioned on a previous slide uh, is for example producing these uh, machines that use an adiabatic quantum computer model. So that's a completely new area of study. And those quantum cryptographies and quantum internet I, I mentioned as being something which is not strictly quantum computing, but anyway, uh, technology utilizing quantum mechanics that may be of, of very big relevance and interest uh, for people working with technology. But that's it. Thank you. And I hope to see some of you in the workshop. Any questions? you show some Q-sharp, uh, what does it look like? You say it, it looks, looks like, like it looks like C-sharp. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, no, it's not like that. Let's see. If no. Haven't really been working, working with that, so. No, well, there's some. Like, it more or less looks exactly the same that you would have. Like, there's nothing special in that. Then that's like a quantum gate, but it just happens to be a not gate, so it's not that more that more exciting than a not in a normal program. Uh, but then when you get to Well, then here you start to have like this Hadamard and C-naughts, and then if you don't know what the Hadamard is, then it's sort of like, what good does to you to you do to you to know that it can be called as a H and certain parameters? So the language is, is exactly the same, or as close to the same as I know without not actually being a C-sharp programmer. Uh, 
but the magic is, is like elsewhere than in the syntax of the language. And in, like you saw on the slide, there's other which are based more on Python and, and others based more on JavaScript and so on. So sort of like the magic doesn't happen on the level of, of how that language is designed. So for example, with Q Sharp, uh, the table said that you can't run it on hardware, you can, can't run it online. Where do you run it? Uh, well, you can use any computer to simulate it. So you can do like, a, it has this, I don't know what's it called. Uh, there's like a built-in simulator that you can use to run that. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm perfectly right about this, but I have a feeling that you can simulate like about 25 qubits on your laptop. And then there are these quantum simulators that resemble like supercomputers and you get to somewhere like 40, 45 qubits on, on such a hardware. So technically we, ah, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just about to ask uh, uh, how close we are to actually breaking the internet and what's stopping it from happening now? Uh, well, yeah, the, it's a, it's a question that is, is not that doesn't have a, a specific answer, but I understood that that we would need something like a couple of hundreds of, of qubits uh, to be able to do this kind of calculation uh, to break the, the current uh, cryptographies. Uh, this uh, and the current record for the most qubits I think is held by Google, which is something like seventy something. Uh, now is 70 close to, to, let's say, 250. Yeah, but we would actually need 250 logical qubits, so qubits that already have the error correction, whereas the 70 is just 70 physical qubits. And then it's a, a up for debate how much error correction you will actually need. But probably it means that we would need to have uh, a few thousand uh, physical qubits to implement a couple of hundred logical qubits. Uh, and in that sense, are we close? Uh, not quite. Uh, fortunately, there's also like close in terms of like how much time we need until, uh, which has been, uh, of course, studied. And we actually today discussed it uh, with some of the guys, guys at NordCloud. And there was this, this US report where they estimated that we're about, or was it at least a decade away uh, from getting that. Uh, okay, so how has the quantum computing community like actually solved or created something new that hasn't been done before? Or like you write <laughs> these programs, what are you actually like going for? Or, like, uh, is it used in anything practical? Yeah, the the uh, the hardware that we currently have. Uh, does not allow us to be better uh, than what the classical computer can can do, uh, and that uh, means that that we have not been employing quantum hardware uh, to do uh, like calculations that would have been unheard of. Uh, however, I think there's actually been like quite a lot of uh, like positive impact on research on different areas. Like people have uh, advanced cryptography quite a lot by thinking about uh, quantum resistant uh, cryptographic algorithms. So those that would, would survive uh, even the advent of, of usable quantum computers. Uh, there's also been some innovations uh, in like quantum inspired computing, like uh, designing new kinds of classical algorith algorithms that are sort of a bit similar uh, to what you would be running in, on a quantum computer, but still run on classical hardware that then have uh, been better than what we have previously had on a classical com computer. Uh, I would, hmm, not sure if I remember correctly, but I would think that there actually is, is at least some machine learning type of examples where this sort of quantum inspired has, has helped uh, to then advance that field of study. You were thinking. Why do you still use putty? It it has a, a, a cozy feel <laughs> to it. I don't I don't know. It would be very hard to irsi without putty for me. <laughs> or I guess it might be naughty. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, because the uh, SSH is now also for Windows. So yeah. Just wondering. 
the important topic, nevertheless. One yeah. final question. Uh, what's the hello world of quantum programs? Uh, well, it's basically this, what, what they're showing here. Uh, uh, what they do here, I guess it's explained somewhere, but it's like, I'm sure, I hope I don't lie about this being the same thing. Yeah, so simplest program possible to build and, and demonstrate quantum superposition, superposition and quantum entanglement. So you j take two qubits and make them entangled. That's basically the hello world of quantum computing. And that's something that we also build in the workshop. Uh, and then we try to find time to also do like a two-bit addition. That's about it. Or qubit in this case. Okay. Thank you.